Hello, and welcome to a topic lecture for the February 2023 Public Forum Debate topic. My name is Jet Smith, and I'm the head coach of speech and debate at Highland High School in Pocatello, Idaho. And the point of this video and all others on my channel is to make learning about debate more accessible to both students and coaches. So in this video, I'm hoping to give you a good introduction to the topic so that you can be prepared to debate uh, because the topic is coming up real soon. So uh, where are we going in this video? We're going to discuss three things. First, resolutionary analysis. What is the topic actually asking us? Then we'll delve into some pro arguments, and then we'll finish with some con arguments. Now, just for understanding purposes, uh, this video is going to be giving you the basic intro to arguments rather than giving you specific pieces of evidence or warrants as to why the arguments are super true. It's your job through research uh, in the resolution to find the evidence and the reasons why the arguments that I'm delving into are correct. However, I have gotten all of these arguments based off of things that I have read in the literature, so I know that evidence exists for each of these points. So the first thing we're going to discuss is a analysis of the resolution. And resolutionary analysis in public forum debate has five parts, trichotomy, definitions, background, core controversy, and stakeholders, each of which we'll go through. So first step of analyzing the resolution is what type is it? Is it policy, fact, or value? Now, because this topic is a benefits versus harms topic, it is a value topic. Uh, because value topics are phrased as X is good or X is bad or X is better than something else. Now, sometimes Y is implied. So this topic is essentially saying X is not better than Y. Now, some people will say that because this topic has an actor being the United States and technically an action right to work laws, that this is a policy topic, but they are wrong because if it was a policy topic, it would say the United States should abolish right to work laws or the United States should adopt a national right to work law. That would make it a policy topic because of the word should, uh, whereas this is evaluation of what's currently happening. So other things to understand is that because this is not a policy topic, just because the resolution is true does not mean that we eliminate right to work laws. And just because the resolution is false does not guarantee that we adopt right to work laws. So voting one way or the other does nothing to change the status quo. The topic is merely an evaluation of the current world or perhaps the future world. So next up is definitions. We have to understand the topic and the topic is resolved in the United States, right to work laws do more harm than good. Now, this resolution is way more simple than the January or even the November, December public forum resolutions. So for right to work laws, that's really the only thing we need to define. According to Ballotpedia No Date, right to work laws guarantee that no employee can be guaranteed to join a union or be required to pay dues to a labor union as a condition of employment. Right to work laws also prohibit labor unions and employers from only employing unionized workers. Now, something to understand is that a lot of definitions, especially the first ones that pop up when you try to find them, are extremely biased in their writing and come from the organizations that advocate for or against the concept. So if the website's title is right to work or something about right to work in the title, probably not a very trustworthy place to get the definition. Regardless of where you get your definition, it needs to clarify that right to work laws prevent being forced to join and or pay dues for a union. Right to work is not the same thing as right to work under human rights law. It does not guarantee that a job will be available for anybody who wants a job. Rather, it is a catchy slogan attached to a legislation that means you do not have to pay dues for a labor union that you are not a part of and you are not required to join a union in the first place. Now, even though it's not in the topic, I think it's important to understand what right to work laws are regulating, and that is labor unions. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Labor No Date, labor unions are a group of employees who join together to advance common interests such as wages, benefits, schedules that strengthens their ability to negotiate with their employer about their concerns, vacation days, paid sick leave, and retirement benefits, flexible scheduling, protection against harassment, and safer working conditions improve the quality of jobs and workers' well-being. Unions are membership-driven. So labor unions are collective organizing from people who work at a similar business or in a similar field who come together to work with their employers to negotiate for better pay, better benefits, better everything. So now that we understand what the topic is asking us, how did we get here? Why are we debating this in the first place? 
So back in 1937, the Wagner Act, or officially the National Labor Relations Act, was passed. This both established the National Labor Relations Board, which is something that looks through disputes and tries to help uh, labor unions and businesses reach common ground, also meant that closed shops were allowed. And a closed shop was a business where if you wanted to work there, the union could negotiate with the employer to require membership of the union. So if there was a fast food labor union, uh, then you could, in your contract with McDonald's as the labor union, require that McDonald's only hire people who were part of the fast food worker labor union. But that changed in 1945 with the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act. This act changed the Wagner Act in a lot of ways. The first thing it did is it prohibited closed shops, which meant that nowhere in the country could a state require that union membership is necessary in order for you to work there. It also meant that states were allowed, if they wanted to, to prohibit agency shops where employees could be required to pay fees that cover the cost of bargaining on their half. So in a closed shop, you have to be part of the union if you want to work there. In an agency shop, you don't have to be part of the union, but you still have to pay dues for the union because the union will negotiate with the employer in a way that represents you. And that is because labor unions have to resent all people or have to represent all people who work at the companies that they are negotiating with, not just union members. Third is the thing that happened after the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act and what went on for many decades and what is still going on is states are adopting right-to-work laws. Since the Taft-Hartley Act, 27 states have adopted right-to-work laws. And remember, those right-to-work laws basically say that agency shops cannot exist. It means that you cannot be required to join a union and you cannot be required to pay for the dues of being a union member uh, if you are not a member of that union. So labor unions are allowed, um, and if you want to join them, you'll have to pay dues. But if you don't join, you can't be forced to pay dues thanks to -to right-to-work law. So in the last 11 years, five states have adopted the right-to-work laws, whereas most others adopted it decades ago. And those would be Wisconsin, West Virginia, Michigan, Kentucky, and Indiana. The most recent development was in 2018 when the Supreme Court case of Janus versus American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees was decided. Now, this Supreme Court case overturned an earlier Supreme Court case called Abood versus Detroit. Forgot to look up what BD stands for of education, which uh, means that now you can't have any agency shops for public sector employees. So you cannot have, uh, like, for example, teachers unions cannot require that uh, people who are not part of the teachers union pay dues because the teachers are technically employed by the public sector or by the government or the state. So that means uh, that essentially closed shops and agency shops are banned for public sector employees, whereas only closed shops are banned worldwide, no matter, not worldwide, countrywide, no matter what type of job you have. And agency shops are also banned by right to work laws. So in 23 states, uh, you can be required to pay dues for a union, even if you're not a part of it. But in 27 laws, you cannot be required to pay dues for a union that you are not a part of. So additionally, these are those 27 states. I'm not going to say all of them, but you can see a map of them here. The green states are those with right-to-work laws. The gray states are those without. Delaware technically has a city or a district inside of it that has right-to-work laws, but it is not a state right-to-work law. Uh, Missouri also used to have a right-to-work law, but overturned it. Uh, And there are also other states that are not currently greened out that are considering measures to adopt right-to-work laws. So now that we understand what right-to-work laws are, what is this topic really asking us? And this topic is a lot more simple than previous public forum resolutions this year. One simpler way of wording the topic to get to the heart of it would be, should workers be required to pay dues to unions even if they are not members? If yes, vote pro. If no, vote con. And really, this topic is just saying unions, if you like them, vote pro. If you don't, vote con. Because right-to-work laws effectively destroy labor unions. They don't get rid of them, but they definitely take away a lot of their power. So 
Lastly, we have stakeholders, and that is who is actually at risk here? Who is affected by the topic? The people involved in right-to-work laws impacts are first workers in right-to-work states. Uh, so how does it affect the people who live in the states where they've adopted those laws? Next, you have employers, employers being the people who hire employees. Um, so that would be people, employers in both kinds of states, employers in right to work states and employers in not right to work states, as well as consumers in both areas. So these are the three major groups of people who will be affected by the resolution. So now that we've covered the gist of what the topic is about, let's delve into some pro arguments. So the first thing that you have to understand about all the pro arguments on this topic is that right to work decreases union membership and union membership is good. That's pretty much the baseline assumption of every single pro argument. So what's necessary is you have to have lots of evidence and lots of warrants or reasons as to why right to work laws decrease union membership and why union membership is good. You also have to understand that right to work laws decrease the power of unions and that union power is good, which are very similar things. So it's all going to be about how you can have the best reasons why these things are true, but it's pretty impossible to win on the pro if you aren't writing from these two perspectives. So understanding these two arguments first is going to be essential to writing any pro contentions. But now let's go ahead and talk about the first argument area, and that is allowing for free riders. So first on this argument, the uniqueness is that unions, in order to operate, have to take funds from workers and then use them to advocate on their behalf. So by paying membership dues to the union, the union can then use that money to acquire legal representation or to pay people whose job it is to advocate on behalf of the union. Now, the link or how the topic affects this is that right to work laws allow employees that are not part of the union uh, and who don't pay their fair share of union dues to still benefit from gains made by the unions. This is because when a union advocates for increasing wages or increasing vacation time, they can't say only give these benefits to people who are part of the union, they have to make it available for all employees, which means that people who are not paying their fair share are getting all of the benefits of union membership with none of the payment. The impact is that freeloaders are people who benefit from union status without actually being part of it or paying for it is unfair and they decrease the overall power of unions. Now, the second argument area is about decreasing insurance coverage. So right now, union membership increases health insurance coverage. Most people who are part of a union are more likely to have health insurance than those that are not part of a union. However, right to work laws, like we said in those two main assumptions of reading pro arguments, decrease union membership and union power. Uh, the impact of which is if you lack proper health insurance, coverage, that means that you'll have more medical debt, more health problems. There's a whole bunch of different reasons why health insurance matters. So when you look at that link of right to work laws, decrease union membership and power, there's a whole bunch of different things that you could insert there. Number one is if you don't have to pay to be part of the union, but you still get its benefits, a lot of people won't work for it. Uh, if union membership cannot be required, then that means that unions aren't going to have a lot of power. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of different reasons why right to work laws make it so that people don't be part of unions and why they don't have as much power. And that causes people to lose health insurance on the case of this argument. Third argument is about decreasing job security. So union membership prevents workers from being fired in most cases without just cause. And also if a worker is fired and it seems like it was unfair for them to be terminated, then the union will represent those worker in legal battles over that unjust termination. So union membership gives people a lot of job security, but because right to work laws decrease union membership and union power, that means that people are more likely to be improperly fired. And if they're improperly fired, they can go into poverty and have to be more reliant on welfare. Fourth argument area is about decreasing wages. So union membership increases wages by increasing the collective power of workers to bargain with their employers. If one employee asks for a raise, it's pretty easy for the boss to be like, mm, no, because even if you quit, you're replaceable. Whereas if the entire union or all of the members threaten to quit working or threaten to go on strike, if they don't get more money, then it will 
be a lot more persuasive. So unions are better at advocating for increased wages. Right to work laws, unfortunately, decrease union membership and union power once again. And the impact of that means that you are lowering wages and lowering wages means increasing poverty and forcing people to work multiple jobs, uh, which can be bad for their health, bad for their mental health, bad for their overall well-being. Fifth argument is about decreasing worker benefits. So union membership makes people more likely to get benefits like paid vacation time, consistent working hours, as well as retirement payments. Each one of those three things could technically be its own contention in and of itself. But your argument is that people who are part of a union are more likely to get benefits like these on top of their actual salary or on top of their hourly wage. However, right to work laws, again, decrease the frequency of union membership and power. So the impact of this, why does it matter? Because vacation time, consistent working hours and retirement benefits improve the quality of life for workers and their families. Sixth, you have decreasing worker safety. So union membership improves working conditions and safety precautions from employers. If you are part of a union, again, that union has more power than just one person who asks for things to be made safer or who expresses a concern, which means that employers, in order to avoid a backlash from the union, are more likely to engage in safer practices that will prevent workplace accidents and deaths. But unfortunately, right to work laws decrease union membership and decrease union power, preventing them from uh, advocating for such things. And if we increase workplace accidents, uh, or if without in states with right to work laws, that leads to increased workplace accidents, sickness, and death on the job. Seventh is hurting political organizing. Uh, so uniqueness here is that unions frequently use membership dues, yes, to represent their employees with the employer. However, they also use membership dues to engage in political organizing, to advocate for legislation and for political candidates that will do things that benefit workers across the entire economy. So for example, if there are politicians or pieces of legislation that want to increase the overall minimum wage, that want to change the work week hours, that want to uh, improve funding for schools or any causes that unions might be interested in, unions can use their excess membership dues to be able to advocate for those policies and those politicians. The problem is that right to work laws decrease union membership funds and power, which means that they are no longer able to use those membership dues uh, because they don't have enough of them uh, or they don't have the sway to be able to make a difference politically. That means that we are not going to see as much passage of beneficial legislation. We won't see worker benefits be advocated for at the same rate. We'll see more income inequality. You could also read a scenario about uh, Democrats winning elections if you are uh, in a circuit where that type of argument would win, where you could argue that labor unions have a huge impact on the likelihood of uh, democratic success in campaigns. And that means that with in states with right to work laws, it makes it much more difficult for Democrats to win. And then your impact could be about why Democrats winning matters. Uh, but again, that argument's not gonna work everywhere, whereas just the generic, the generic political organization contention should work in most places. Eighth argument is increasing income inequality. Uh, so unions increase and equalize wages for people of color, for women, for older workers. So again, if it's a lot easier when one employee is by themselves to be denied raises, to be denied benefits, to be denied being treated equally, and a union forces people together, it opens up the floor for conversations about how much money people are making to make sure that they're all getting treated equally. So unions are shown to increase income inequality uh, for people of color, for women, and for older workers. But again, right to work laws, decrease union membership, funds, and power, making this important job less likely to occur. And then the impact being that income inequality is unfair, discriminatory, and leads to lower life expectancy and satisfaction for whatever group of people you are saying it will increase income inequality for. Ninth argument is increasing rapid population growth. Uh, so the uniqueness for this argument is that a lot of states are adopting right to work laws. Uh, and when they adopt those right to work laws, people are moving to uh, right to work states, not right to work laws, at higher and higher rates. And they're moving rather rapidly. The problem is that when so many people are moving 
away from states without these laws to states with these laws, it is causing rapid population growth. And when too many people move to a place at once, then it puts strains on social services that haven't had time to adapt and uh, haven't recuperated tax revenues from the new residents yet to be able to pay for these things. That includes the healthcare, education, and housing sectors, all of which could be their own contentions with their own impacts. Tenth and finally, we have increasing teacher shortages. This is kind of like a more specific version of the previous argument, uh, but it's a little bit different. The uniqueness is you argue the right to work laws hurt teacher unions, uh, because if there's a right to work laws, then that means teachers can't be required to join or pay for teachers unions. Uh, and if teacher unions are not able to work as effectively, a lot of teachers will move away from the states with right to work states uh, to get better pay and benefits. So if they're moving away from the right to work state to a state uh, that does not have that law, then the right to work state is going to experience higher levels of teacher shortages, which you will argue are bad because they decrease the overall quality of education for students. So before moving on to the con, again, remember that it's important on the pro to prove that unions are good, that unions are necessary, and that right to work laws directly hurt union membership levels and hurt union power and funding levels. If you can prove those things, then it's really just a question of your uniqueness for the argument and your impact for the argument, because the link, as you can see, will be virtually the same for almost every single point. The con, on the other hand, has a little bit more variety to their arguments where they can also use the exact same link. And if the pro has already proven that uh, right to work laws decrease union membership, all you have to do now is prove that that's actually a good thing rather than it being a bad thing. So the con can try and win that it doesn't decrease union membership or it doesn't have the same effect that the pro is talking about or they can concede to the idea that it decreases union membership and then just explain that that's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. So for 10 con arguments, first we have attracting businesses. I see this as being a very popular argument. Uh, the uniqueness is that states are adopting right to work laws uh, increasingly and a lot more states have them. And right to work states attract corporate businesses who want to open new locations or move their headquarters uh, and also, more people are likely to start small businesses in right-to-work states, um, and really the reason why is because they're not going to have to pay their workers as much or because the profit margins are going to be higher. But either way, there will be more businesses in these areas, and if there's more businesses in these areas, then there will be more jobs open for people and there will be more services offered to citizens. Second argument is about decreasing political corruption. I think this is a very good argument. The uniqueness is that unions use membership dues to engage in political activities that endorse specific politicians who will then go on to pass laws favorable to the unions, creating this cycle where a union uses money to get a politician elected. The politician then does stuff that unions like. The unions continue to use money to endorse that candidate and so on and so forth, creating corruption. Luckily, right to work laws decrease the amount of excess funds that unions budget have to do activities that are outside of their workplace, like through political fundraising, uh, and that prevents their ability to engage in corrupt activities. And then your impact can be a lot of different things, but essentially it's going to argue that political corruption undermines democracy and stops progress. Third argument is decreasing taxes. This argument is a little bit sketchy, but I think a lot of judges will care so much about the impact that they'll give you the earlier parts. The uniqueness is that right to work laws decrease the power and popularity of public sector unions. Remember, these are unions that are not for private businesses, but rather for government employees. So that would be things like teachers, uh, could be police officers, could be people in the military, things like that. So right to work laws decrease the overall power and popularity of public sector unions. And whenever the public sector advocates for something, usually in the form of more benefits, in the form of more pay, anything like that, the people who pay for that, rather than just eating into the profits of a private business, uh, instead the people who pay for these uh, advances are usually members of the public and they pay for them through taxes. And then your impact is just saying that right to work laws uh, are a good thing because they decrease the power of these unions that are constantly going to try to increase taxes to pay for their increases in benefits. And then you argue that increasing taxes are bad because it increases poverty, decreases monetary circulation in the economy, because instead of that money going from business to business, uh, instead it goes from business to government. 
Fourth argument is about decreasing unemployment. So your uniqueness argument, again, is going to be that states are passing right to work laws and businesses in right to work states uh, the, as the link are hiring more employees because if you don't have to pay your workers as much, you can afford to hire more of them. And there are more businesses in the first place in states with right to work laws because of that capital investment argument we talked about earlier. And then your impact is just that unemployment is really bad because it increases poverty and it's bad for people's mental health. Fifth argument is about expelling bad employees. This says that right to work laws decrease the frequency and popularity of unions. Now, when you work for a union, one of the biggest benefits is providing you with job security because you are less likely to be fired uh, because it's more likely to be a headache for the bosses if you are fired when you're part of a union because the union can fight back and represent you. The problem is that that applies equally to bad workers, people who might not be violating their contract uh, in a serious way, but are not efficient, not productive, are not contributing to a positive workplace culture and are causing real damage. So unions make firing bad employees difficult and then your impact is that bad employees hurt workplace culture and decrease productivity. So the idea is that right to work laws are beneficial or are good because they make it easier to fire bad employees. Sixth argument is holding unions accountable. Uh, uniqueness is that right to work laws mean that workers aren't forced to join labor unions. You can't force people to be part of a union and you can't force them to pay for the union. And the link to this accountability argument is that if you know that you can't guarantee union membership and you are part of the union or you are running the union, then you will use your resources more efficiently, more fairly, and you will be better at your job and work harder so that you can prove that being part of the union is good so that you will get more people to want to join you. If you know that everybody has to join the union or everybody has to pay for the union, regardless of how good of a job you're doing, then that doesn't really motivate you to do a really good job as a union. So the impact is that union accountability decreases corruption, improves performance, and improves negotiations with employers. Seventh argument for the con is increasing investment. So uniqueness, once again, states are adopting right to work laws. And that is a good thing because investors are interested in businesses operating in right to work states and starting them there or giving money and buying shares of businesses in those areas because they believe that they will have higher profit margins. And then your impact is about why investment matters. When businesses get invested in, they're more likely to try inventing new products or delivering services in a different way, which is innovation. They're more likely to be new startup businesses as well as protecting the stock market. So you're basically just going to say that increased investment is a really good thing. Next con argument area, we have increasing worker income. Uh, or increasing take-home pay is another way that you could say this. So the uniqueness argument is that if you are living under a right-to-work law, you are not required to pay union dues if you don't want to be part of the union. And you will argue that it's a good thing because union dues are incredibly expensive for low-income workers uh, because that money adds up over time, especially if you are living in or right on the poverty line. And then the impact is that if you have more take-home pay, then you can afford to pay your bills and it will also help to alleviate poverty. Ninth argument area is population growth. So uniqueness, once again, states are adopting right-to-work laws. The link argument is that people are moving to states with right-to-work laws for a lot of different reasons. They don't want to pay membership dues um, and you know there, there'll be more uh, they don't want to have to be part of a union. They might want to live in a more conservative state. And your argument is that population growth is actually a good thing uh, because it means that there will be more revenue going into the government, uh, that there will be a variety of goods and services available because when people come, they bring their skills, they bring their businesses, or they start businesses. Uh, and it also means increased job opportunities. Because if more people are moving, for example, then you have to get more people who need to build the homes. And then you have to get more people to provide furniture for the homes. You have to get more people to work at the grocery stores to feed the people that are moving there. So population growth also helps to create jobs. Tenth and final argument area for the con is going to be protecting various freedoms. This is more of a value-based argument than the traditional 
uh, monetary politics or um, death-based impacts that you see in public forum. The uniqueness argument is that the Constitution guarantees Americans the freedom of speech and the freedom of association. However, right-to-work laws uh, help these uh, because they prevent people from being forced to join or support unions that don't reflect their values and views. So, for example, if a union is supporting candidates or supporting policies that are morally against what you believe and you didn't have a right-to-work law, you might have to pay uh, for those messages to be spread, which would directly go against your freedom of speech and your freedom of association. And then the impact being that your freedom of speech and freedom of association are essential human rights. So that was the 2023 February Public Forum topic lecture on resolved in the United States right to work laws do more harm than good. I think that this topic has a lot of potential, but I also think that it could get very simple and muddled at the same time. Most of the pro arguments rely on the same base assumptions. They rely on the fact that right to work laws hurt unions and that unions are good. If the pro can win those things, it's going to be a lot easier for them to win the rest of the debate. If they can't win those things, it's pretty much impossible. The con, on the other hand, doesn't really have to prove that one thing in all of their arguments, but I think it's almost undeniable in 2023 with the level of inequality that we're experiencing uh, and what is in the literature that pretty much right to work laws are an undeniable good. Most of the articles for the con side that say that right to work laws are not good are funded for from uh, big anti like uh, union lobbying organizations or they're on news sites that are, you know, have a corporate interest in making sure that unions do not get stronger. So as the con, I think you have to be very careful with your evidence to make sure that you're not just reading pro-corporate propaganda, same thing goes for the pro, don't read arguments and evidence directly from labor unions themselves. I think if the con is able to prove that uh, unions don't benefit workers as much as the pro is saying they do, uh, then they'll have a much easier time. However, if the con's arguments are all resting upon the idea that uh, who cares about workers, then I think you're not going to have uh, as strong of an argument. So with that being said, I wish you the best of luck on this topic. I know that in Idaho, this is our national qualifiers and for a lot of people, our district's topic, which means that these cases are going to matter a lot. I highly suggest using the best quality evidence that you can find, making sure that you understand your argument from front to back, and making sure that if you read your case to the average person, they'd be able to understand everything that you were talking about. So thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.